Okay. So today's lecture, YouTube, user-generated content, database systems, and cookies. Today will be mostly about user-generated content. Okay. So what we'll cover, first of all, YouTube as a social media site. Then what user-generated content is and how YouTube uh, manages, manages it for revenue streams. Time permitting, we'll start in on database systems and cookies will certainly defer till next week. Okay, so most people don't think of YouTube as a social media site, but depending on who you ask, it is one of the world's top social media sites. So, it meets the basic definition of social media in that, number one, it allows users to interact and form connections, right? They can contact each other, they can send messages. You can do content sharing. Besides personal messages, you can also upload videos and other people can see those videos. And it's big, there's a big pool of people to socialize with, about 1.5 billion monthly users last I checked. That's probably from a couple years ago, so it's, if anything, I'm sure it's up a little bit now. However, the reason why most people don't think of it as social media is a very qualitatively different experience compared to Facebook. Number one, typical Facebook users connect with people they already know or knew from real life, right? So if you're in, say, high school and you set up your Facebook account, who's going to be your friends? Your actual friends, right? People you go to school with, people in the neighborhood, and probably some of your relatives because that's basically your social pool at that age. Uh, if you're old, right, if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s and you join Facebook, then the people that are on your account are mostly going to be people that you knew, right? People that you went to school with at various times, and you'll have some set of people that you're uh, present friends with. So either way, right, you connect with people that you already know in some sense from real life. On the other hand, typical YouTube connections, they don't happen between people that know each other in real life. They happen through a shared interest in content categories. For example, uh, lately for IDS 201, I've been posting a bunch of uh, Java videos, how to code in Java sort of stuff. And so, I mean, these are not going to take YouTube by storm and bring me millions of dollars every year. But suppose, hypothetically, somebody else was interested in Java and they said, hey, you know, Doug, I like your videos. They're pretty good. And I say, well, thank you. You know, tune in for more. There's, you know, there's more stuff coming. Right. So you might become friends with people, you know, or at least casual YouTube level friends by the fact that one of you is posting content that you're interested in. Or maybe a cluster of people say, oh, this one guy posting these videos is pretty good. Let's, uh, you know, contact each other. We can like comment about the videos, whatever. However, unlike Facebook, many YouTube users never post content or even directly interact with others. Myself. I only started posting content within the last uh, few months, just for uh, IDS 200. Actually, I, I guess I did it over the summer a little bit. I was posting stuff uh, to YouTube over the summer. But until then, you know, I'd been using the site for more than 10 years and I'd never posted anything. Likewise, I believe I have literally never directly uh, contacted anyone. I've never sent a personal message. I don't think I've ever uh, commented on a video either. Anyway, so. So I'm there, but I'm not social. And that's the real difference is most people on YouTube aren't social in the way that they are on Facebook. So it's easy to not think of YouTube as social media. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, next thing. User-generated content. So user-generated content, or UGC, is anything created by users and made public. Okay, so it includes not only, right, obviously videos that people upload to YouTube, but also comments on uh, public message boards or comments you make below videos, blog articles, right, not really a thing on YouTube, but sure, on other social media it could be. Anyway, for UGC, immediate profit often isn't the real motivator. People, most people who post content don't do it in order to make money. Like me, I'm posting my uh, Java videos. I'm not doing that to make money. I'm not running ads on them. I don't care. I have like 60 subscribers. How much money am I going to make, right? My videos get like 20 views each. So what is, uh, what is the motivation? Well, in my case, it's a professional motivation, right? I'm posting up this content so that people who miss classes can see the stuff they need, right? And I think that uh, the side gain for me is maybe I get a little less email about it than I otherwise would. So there's that little bit of self-interest. But a lot of times with uh, UGC, it could be things like contributing to a debate or a discussion, right? People get on Facebook threads about whatever the debate topic of the day is. 
Uh, I suppose this week it would be, you know, whether impeachment is justified or not. So, you know, people get on there. Nobody thinks they're really going to convert anybody, but people just want to vent or they want to make their opinions known. Uh, Number two, pursuit of an existing interest, right? Suppose you are a blogger and you are blogging about, I don't know, football. Maybe football is your thing. Okay, and so you make a blog about football and you hope that people will interact and comment and you can have interesting discussions about whether the Bears will ever win another game again, stuff like that. Uh, Or social goals, right? Some people want to become famous. Some people have that as a thing. They want to become an internet superstar in some way. Other people just want to make contact with others because, you know, they're tired of living in their isolated little bubble. They want to meet people. Okay, so again, yeah, you can make money with UGC. There are bloggers who make money. Obviously, there are YouTube people that make money. But the vast majority of user-generated content is done without any expectation of payoff. Okay. So comparing the two, Facebook versus YouTube. So for Facebook, typically there's an existing connection and the YouTubes build it or strengthen it by sharing content, right? So for example, uh, I have many relatives who are very old and they like to see pictures of the grandkids or, you know, the grand nieces and nephews, whatever. So we post up pictures of them and they're like, oh, so cute. That's wonderful, right? And maybe, you know, they remember us when birthdays or Christmas come around, whatever. I mean, that's not what we're in it for, but it does strengthen the connection, right? Otherwise, these would be some uh, fairly distant relatives that I see like once a year at most. Yeah, it's uh, our family is basically at the point where we see each other at weddings and funerals anymore. And there aren't many weddings these these days. Uh, Number two, user generated content is typically created for its own sake. For example, Even if I didn't have anybody who wanted to see pictures of my kids, I would still post them up on Facebook just as a way of storing them in the cloud, right? So it'd be like one more place I could archive the best pictures and not have to worry about losing them. And I could do my own kind of arrangements on that for when I want to see them later. And of course, on Facebook, individuals rarely monetize their connections. They rarely find a way to cash in on those connections. Even if you do, if you try to do that on Facebook, most of your friends are going to think you're kind of a dick. Right? You ever have any friends on Facebook that try to sell you stuff through Facebook? And you're like, ugh, I can't quite look at you the same anymore, right? I got some friends in my age bracket, you know, some uh, housewives, they try to do Tupperware sales and they send out the emails. Oh man, if I just sell like another $50 or $100 worth of stuff, I'll be able to get this vacation to Hawaii. And you know, Doug, I, we were always such great buddies. I, I always thought you were a good guy. And I'm like, ugh, ugh, get, ugh. right? Yeah, you don't, you don't try to sell stuff to your friends. That's just wrong. Okay. However, businesses do, right? It's totally legit for businesses on Facebook. They set up a Facebook page. They try to, you know, reveal their new prod, prod, products that are coming up, and they hope that strikes some interest, and people show up and buy them, right? For example, like maybe with McDonald's, every time they do, a, you know, the McRib, which kind of floats around the country these days, they announce, hey, McRib. They announce it on their Facebook page, and they hope that that's one more mechanism by which people can go get McRibs. All right. YouTube, on the other hand, individuals do post content that can build connections, but typically not close personal ones, right? Even if you have a bunch of followers on YouTube, chances are you're not going to be best buddies with more than a tiny fraction of them, right? So you look at anybody on YouTube that has like 10 million followers, 10 million subscribers, they're not going to be friends with 10 million people, right? They probably don't even want to try to be friends with that many people. They just want the, okay? And monetizing those connections is standard. It's entirely expected that if you post up YouTube content, you're going to run ads on it and you're going to cash in. Over time, individuals can become brands for their content categories. So, for example, let's do this. Let's see if my internet is up today. You guys ever heard of Disney Collector? That's a no, okay. Disney Collector was this lady, uh, a few, she had to change her name uh, because I think Disney got after her, but her whole thing was that she just showed her hands and opened toys, right? She was like uh, targeted towards toddlers. She'd buy toys and she'd like had uh, crazy fun nails and she'd talk, hey guys, Disney Collector here. Ooh, let's see what's in this package. Oh look, it's Anna and Elsa from Frozen and they're beating up Olaf. They're gonna dunk him in the hot water. Oh no, be stuff like that. And you know, you laugh, but as I recall in 2014, she made $5 million doing that. So Disney Collector. So this is basically it. Uh, 
Fun Toys by Disney Collector. Let's see how my sound is today. That's loud. Skip you. This looks like it's in Spanish. Okay, so. There's something here. Yeah, this one's in Spanish, so I don't think it's her, but you get the idea. Okay, people open up toys, they play with them. Hey, look, here's some toys, yeah. Okay. So, individuals become brands for their own content categories. There's other things like programming or, uh, you know, sports or video games. Apparently, that's a thing with young people. You watch people play video games and swear at the screen and stuff. Yeah, so they become brands. Anyway, so the difference is... In Facebook, the focus is on people, and in YouTube, the focus is on content, right? Facebook, you check out what people are doing because you're interested in those people, right? My, uh, you know, great aunt Loray, she's interested in seeing what my kids are up to. She's interested in us. On YouTube, she couldn't care less about, you know, Java programming or anything IT. She's not going to show up and tune into that. Okay. So, social media advertising. Now, here's a comparison. This is how things are different. So, back before the internet, think like 1990 or so, or I guess for most or all of you, before you were born, uh, media and advertising were typically one way. Media speaks and the customer listens. Now, the good thing about that is the message can be totally controlled, right? So there are TV commercials, there's radio commercials. That, that's the message, and people hear it. Now, people might believe it or not. They might turn to the person next to them and say, yeah, sure, that, yeah, that, that's the thing there, right? But, you know, they can't really do much to group together and, like, laugh at it. So, of course, in that case, the information is regarded as tilted, right, biased, or potentially misleading. So, even though the advertisers can control the message, people are inherently going to be skeptical about it because, like, Oh, listen, there's Microsoft telling us how great the new version of Windows is going to be. Well, of course, what else are they going to say, right? They're going to tell us, well, we made this new version of Windows, and it sucks, and it's going to be a huge pain in the ass. You should probably just stick with uh, Windows 3.1, right? Well, they're not going to. So anyway, so even if customers listen, they're often skeptical, right? So the source controls the message, but the source is also not really considered trustworthy. Social media models, though, they present opportunities and risks. So the risk, it's two-way communication. Advertisers present information and allow customers to respond. For example, Microsoft might say, hey, here's our new version of Windows, post something about it on their Facebook page and allow people to comment, right? Bring people in to try it out. Tell us what you think, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. So ideally, if this works well, it mimics word of mouth from unbiased users. So the information would be considered much more reliable, right? If you hear from a neutral pool of supposedly unbiased users, right? So Microsoft, they might pay one guy or three guys to show up in a commercial and say how great it is. They're probably not going to pay 10,000 people to show up and tell how great Windows is, right? On some big, long message thread like that. So the information, yeah, much more trustworthy, right? It's from a bunch of neutral users, hopefully similar to you. The downside, potentially lose control of the message. Now, does anybody here remember Bill Cosby? What's Bill Cosby in prison for? A long series of basically roofing girls with uh, Benadryl, which sounds kind of crazy, but apparently that was a thing, right? You guys, does anybody remember how all this shit hit the fan for Bill Cosby? Well, there was a comic, I believe in Philadelphia, who was talking, you know, something along the lines of... Uh, well, NBC was in, you know, a new series. They were in the works to make a new series, basically a reboot of The Cosby Show, which is a tremendously successful uh, show from the 80s and 90s. Anyway, so NBC wanted to do a reboot on that with Bill Cosby as now, you know, grandpa or something. And some comedian in Philly, you can look up who it was, I think it was Philly, goes on a little thing about, you know, hey, can you believe they're bringing back The Cosby Show? You know, you know, you know, everybody thinks he's America's dad. He should be America's rapist. Uh, and they're... You know, the, the crowd is like, what? And he says, yeah, go look it up, right? Because there have been sexual assault, assault charges against him in the past, but, you know, they've basically kind of gone away. And so people looked it up, and what really made it explode, believe it or not, around this time, NBC had a little promotion for Bill Cosby, 
uh, for the reboot of the Cosby show. And they said, hey, write your own Cosby meme. Let's see what you got. And so if you look up all this stuff, all right, if you do images, Google, Bill Cosby meme, okay, you get stuff like, oh, there's some, uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's the cleanest one. My social media manager did what? But you can imagine how all this stuff is. So needless to say, that whole project went off the rails. They lost control of the message, right? If there hadn't been for social media to blow up that kind of stuff and get everybody in the world talking about it simultaneously, people might have just heard the story and kind of rolled their eyes and been like, yeah, whatever, people say anything, Hollywood's a crazy place. But with social media, boom, it's, it's all snowballed. Okay. So that's a key example, of losing control of the message. All right. Now, suppose you want to go to YouTube and brand yourself. You want to set yourself up as a YouTube superstar. Well, first thing, you should understand the vast majority of people would rather watch TV than read articles or books, right? That's just a fact. Look at the number of hours in a day the typical person watches TV versus the typical number of hours a person spends reading voluntarily, okay? Most people just want to like glaze out and like stare at a screen. <coughs> so, given the choice between blogging and YouTubing, right? Two ways to make revenue off user-generated content. Well, number one, blog articles are unlikely to go viral or otherwise build a large following, right? It's possible, it's really unlikely. Just most people not gonna happen. And especially number two, it's difficult for unknowns to make money, right? So if any one of us who, you know, I'm going to assume we don't have any special expertise that would make people want to check out our blog, yeah, who's going to care, right? Doug Lundquist's blog about Java programming. I mean, sure, I know some stuff about Java, but I'm certainly not world class. There's a lot of people that know a lot more. Nobody's going to come to me as an authority on the subject, right? So difficult for unknowns to make much money. YouTube, on the other hand, if you come up with an entertaining video or a sequence of entertaining videos, especially for underserved search terms, very likely to become a hit. So let me give an example. So back around 2012, uh, my wife and I started checking out YouTube looking for kids stuff. And at that time, 2012, most of the things on YouTube were one of two kinds of things. They were either music videos or they were episodes or clips from TV shows. That's most of what you had on YouTube. But we started seeing this new category of stuff that was geared actually for little kids to watch. And a lot of it was user-generated content. For example, sidewalk cops. Anybody heard of sidewalk cops? No, why would you? Right, unless you got little nieces and nephews. Okay, sidewalk cops. Here we go. Visits, whatever. We can look at this whole library, right? For example, I want to find the first one. But you look at them all. They're like 30 million views, 60 million views. But the first one, I want to find what the first one is. All right, funky. Uh, let's try to find the first one. It has them. All right, watch the jiggle. Oh, there we go. Uh, we got the whole set of videos. So the playlist, right? This one, 99 million views. This one, 62 million. This one, 32 million, 26. If they're running ads on those, they have made buckets and buckets of money. They have probably made more money on the video than all of us have made in our careers all put together. And I, I know your careers are short, so that makes the math simpler. Okay, Tremendous amounts of money. So they made, uh, got a couple kids. I don't know, they're probably like six, seven, eight. It's hard to tell. And they threw them in some of those little 12-volt cars that the kids drive around in. And they pretended to be cops. And it was pretty cute. And, you know, my son at the time loved them. Uh, my daughter discovered them about a year ago. She watches them. So they make these fun videos, and they made bags and bags of money doing it. Okay. Now, in that case, initial reputation is helpful, but obviously not essential, right? So the point was, when we started looking up videos for kids, this is the stuff we found. So it started off with our kids, uh, my son wanting to see like videos just, believe it or not, of just fire engines barreling down the street with their sirens going. He was like, whoa, so cool. Uh, eventually, you know, he wanted to see police cars, other types of loud vehicles. And somewhere along, you know, watching those, we saw a crossover link. So sidewalk cops were like, sidewalk, okay, let's check that out. Okay. So these guys, they didn't have any reputation to speak of. Nobody knew who they were. But eventually, yeah, they got big. And video views well into the millions are not uncommon. 
even for amateurish productions. All right, so anybody remember the Friday song? Yeah? Friday song. There she is, Rebecca Black. 137 million views, right? She's not Katy Perry, but that's a lot of views for somebody, you know, that, who the hell is this, right? Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So if you can take away from that, if you can figure out something to do on YouTube that isn't already saturated and that people might be kind of interested in, or if you could do a really good job of something that people are interested in, you could make some money off of that. Anyway, uh, so YouTube revenue models. Number one, primarily driven by ads. That's how people make money. Uh, videos could contain ads, right? If you're watching, so we uh, sometimes watch these Peppa Pig marathon things. Peppa Pig are these little five minute short cartoons. And so you get like a two hour block of those. And every you know two or three episodes, there'll be uh, a little commercial break. <clears throat> so. Videos could contain the commercials, interrupted by them. Sometimes there are, you know, sequences of commercials like, you know, ad uh, windows like layered over the video window. They're just kind of embedded in there. And if a viewer clicks an ad shown with your video, you get paid. That's the standard model in YouTube, pay per click, right? Somebody clicks on the video, the video is running with your content, uh, YouTube gets some of the money, the poster of the user-generated content gets some of the money. Now. There was a big concern over copyrights early on. So when YouTube first comes around, uh, user-generated content isn't really a thing. Uh, so YouTube was packed with users trying to monetize non-original content, right? Basically, they'd like uh, set up some connection to MTV. They'd wait for a particular video to come around. They'd capture it in uh, some digital format. They'd upload that digital version of it to YouTube, right? So a lot of that, users trying to monetize non-original content or TV episodes, whatever. Anything that could be played on a TV, they try to capture it so they could upload it. Now, what YouTube has now to check that is a content ID system. Content ID system is basically like Shazam. You guys know Shazam? Shazam is this little app that you can get on your phone that basically if there's a song playing, you can tap Shazam and have it listen, and if it catches a little you know, clear stream of the uh, audio, It'll compare it against its database and tell you what the song is. So it's this neat little, neat little app that does that. And that's basically the same thing. So YouTube has a giant database of video content. If somebody uploads something, YouTube's going to compare, you know, some segment of that with what's in its database and say, oh, you know what? This is something that's copyrighted. You're trying to upload that something's already, you know, something that you didn't create. We're going to flag it. Now, infringement, there are different rules for different countries. But the basic rule, uh, especially in the U.S., is you're not permitted to make money off of some uh, content that you didn't create. So if we look at the policy in YouTube, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay, how content ID works. So what options are available to copyright owners, right? So for example, you are in a band and some person uh, uh, bootlegs a copy of your concert and uploads it to YouTube, okay? So what options would be available to the band in that case? Well, number one, they can block the video from being you, viewed. They can say, hey, YouTube, this is our, our concert. We don't want this to be shown on YouTube at all. They can, and YouTube will take it down. Number two, they can monetize the video. So the band could say, you know what? That's a bootleg of our concert, but you know what? It's fine. Leave it up there. We'll just run ads on it. And then if somebody clicks on those ads, the bootlegger doesn't get paid. The band gets paid. Okay? Or... Well, you can't even see what I'm looking at. Sorry. We've got this kind of recurring problem. Okay? So, you can block the video, you can monetize the video, and you can always track the viewership statistics, and you can change those options at some point. So, the band might say, well, there's only like 10 or 20 people even viewing this video. Who cares? It's not, our, not worth our trouble to even fire off a letter to YouTube. But, you know, if the numbers start going up, then they might say, yeah, you know what? Monetize this. Okay? Now, one of the things you often see, not all this stuff is going to get blocked. For example, uh, there's a lot of uh, video versions where people just show the words. Like, I'm going to guess that they do that for karaoke or something. Uh, there's other cases where they show the video, but they, you know, they have the words in like a rolling stream at the bottom so people actually know what they're saying, stuff like that. Or if you want to make like a subtitle in a language that uh, does not, isn't otherwise available for a movie, 
So little things like that. Yeah, sometimes the uh, copyright holders, they don't care. They'll just let that go. But they always have the option, you know, to put a stop to it. So again, key rule of thumb, if you didn't make the content, YouTube's not really going to allow you to make money off of it. Okay. Uh, I have an interesting article. Well, your mileage may vary, but interesting article there about YouTube promotion by bands. So if you're in some uh, band that you're having trouble, you know, getting gigs or getting heard by whoever, one of the ways uh, people get their, get their music out is through YouTube. They set up a YouTube channel. People will come listen to it. If they like it, they'll come back. They'll tell their friends. It's an easier way to get the word out. So, and they can make money. If people just tune in and click on the videos, the band can make a little bit of money too. Okay. So, earning potential. Now, this is an old one. This is from uh, 2016. So, some people do, in fact, earn quite a lot. So, this guy, PewDiePie, I assume, he was the number one. I'm going to guess some people have heard of him. He made $15 million in 2016, and basically his thing, uh, foul-mouthed Swedish video game commentator. Uh, his videos show him playing various video games while a box in the top corner shows his reactions to what's happening. And he makes $15 million doing that. All right. Uh, some of these other people you may have heard of, I don't know, uh, Colleen Ballinger, uh, Rhett and Link. I've heard of Rhett and Link. Seen some of their stuff. Uh, German Garment, I don't know who, who he is. Uh, Markiplier, I've heard of him. I haven't watched his stuff. Uh, Six Million, Tyler Oakley, Er, Six Million. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of nerdiest baking channel on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff lately that I'm seeing with like people doing crafts. Uh, so like, let me think. Harley Quinn crafts. There's some stuff that my mom, uh, not my mom, my sister, what? Troom Troom, yeah. So Troom Troom, uh, my daughter's been watching a lot of this lately. And basically they have little videos where they cut shit up and they, you know, they make, they amend dolls and they make custom ones. So it's kind of neat to see it all happen, but right, let's, I'm not really here to watch this. Damn it. But I'm saying this one, six million views, right? So you get a couple girls sitting on the couch. They spend like an hour snipping up dolls and they get six million views. Well, how much is that worth? Let's talk about that. Okay. So some other stuff here about uh, uh, highest paid YouTube stars. So if you're interested, right, the top people, they're making in the range of uh, several million dollars a year. So the way it works, first you make the content, then you get the views, and then you get the money. So if you have a cheap video, right, something you're not putting much time or trouble into, you just, you know, have some random recording of something you post up. You might make five or 10 bucks for a thousand views, right? You run ads on it, a few people click, you make a little bit of money, right? And that five to ten dollars obviously depends on a lot of factors, but it's a pretty, you know, typical value. But of course, if you do any production, if you do any advertising, like you pay for traffic to get people to come see your video, that's all going to cut into your profit margin. Then there's not much profit to be had there at that scale. Once you get bigger, though, typical numbers, maybe about a thousand dollars per million views. So, you know, if you see some video up there that says somebody has 100 million views, there's a good chance they made somewhere in the range of, you know, it declines a little bit with scale, but 50 to $100,000. So that, uh, that one girl who made that Friday video, there's a good chance that that basically paid for her college if she wanted it to, or paid for a couple of really nice cars. I don't know. Okay? Now, if you're a really big one, right? So this was uh, a few years ago, $3 billion was a really big number, right? I think uh, that Despacito video is still like the top one. It's probably like seven billion by now. That one. Let's see how many views that has. 6.5 billion, yeah, so that, that's probably the top one. I haven't really checked. You could Google it if you want to find a bigger one. But anyway, rough numbers. They had a video here that made, got three billion views. It earned about two million from ads in YouTube. So the ratio it starts from a few dollars per thousand, tapers off to maybe one dollar per thousand, tapers off to maybe something like fifty cents per thousand views. <coughs> so there you go. There is there is money to be made. All right. So presentation on YouTube, right? 
uh, how YouTube decides what it's going to show you. We'll start talking a little bit about this, and then I guess it'll be a good break point soon, we'll call it a day. So, YouTube has a mix of techniques. Just like Facebook, they're going to show you content with a proven history of user interaction, right? They're going to show you the kind of stuff that other users like you have clicked on. And like Amazon, it's going to show you content that others write with a similar profile view. So part of it is going to be the sort of stuff that you like. Part of it is going to be the stuff that people like you have liked. And basically, clicks matter a lot, uh, and then viewing time also matters. So what they need is some kind of initial baseline. They need an initial baseline to basically figure out what sort of viewer are you. Now, if I look at YouTube right now, because I basically have everything cleared here, if I go back to home, I've only looked at a few things. I've looked at an arts and crafts thing, I've looked at sidewalk cops, and I've looked at Despacito. So what do I have there? I have kid stuff, I have Frozen, I have crafty stuff. Uh, my daughter really likes these slime videos lately. Uh, all right, apparently a music video that's probably like Despacito, I don't know. And then some stuff that's just generically popular, right? So let's, oh yeah, Slither, cool. 200,000, holy shit. All right, a lot of, lot of random stuff there, but most there's some Peppa Pig. Whatever. They think this is the sort of stuff, based on our very limited knowledge about you, this is the stuff we think that you would want to see. Okay. So, but over time, right, it's going to continuously update for things I've done. So profile changes basically means changes in my viewing history. Uh, other things, when new videos get released, YouTube has to integrate them. They have to think, oh, this video is like these other videos. People who like this also like that. Uh, a lot of that is just artist correlation, but it can be other stuff. Uh, and it, again, just like Facebook, immediate consistency isn't terribly important. So not all this has to happen super fast in real time, although some of it it does. So for example, right, if I go to YouTube again, and let's put up something different. Let's put up, I don't know, how to grow pineapples. And I watch, ooh, this looks good. Okay, I'll watch this urban garden and pineapples. So I'm going to watch this, and we'll see, you know, I'll watch a couple things, and you'll see very clearly it gets updated in my uh, profile. Dogs, I want pineapples. It's ridiculous. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Great. Okay, let's check out this. Uh, perpetual pineapples. Now we're talking. Okay, yeah, perpetual. That, uh, yeah, Randy's Tropical Plants. Hi, Randy. This is Randy from Randy's Tropical Plants. All right. Okay. Well, that's pretty neat. All right, so I'll go back to YouTube now. And with that little bit of information, let's see how it changes my profile. So they're thinking, look at that, right off organic uh, growing fruit, childbirth class, NSL, all right. Uh, how to grow roses from cutting. So right off the planting garlic, right off the bat, boom, I watched like 10 seconds of two videos and YouTube thinks, oh, you're interested in gardening. Okay, here you go. Okay, stink horns. That's a kind of mushroom. That's neat. All right, grow orange seed and okay. So that's how that works. Okay. All right. So always there's an initial baseline. If YouTube doesn't have anything on you, they look. They just say, "Oh, you're in such and such region. We're going to either treat you as a typical English speaker or a typical Chicagoland resident, and we're going to show you all the stuff that's uh, you know." Uh, a baseline, a random sprinkling of data that hopefully somewhere in that 40 or so videos you see on YouTube's homepage, there's something there you're interested in, we can learn a little bit more about you. Or if not, you'll search for it and they'll learn about you that way. <coughs> okay. So, YouTube landing page. When you first visit YouTube, right, you get a standard mix of whatever content is locally popular. And, you know, locally popular, again, is probably just means specific to whoever is connected to that data center. So just like Amazon, YouTube wants to make it easier for you to find interesting content, right? Amazon wants to make it easier for you to find interesting products. They do the people who looked at this also look that. 
basically the same thing YouTube is doing, except instead of products, it's videos. It's going to say people who watch this video also watch these other ones. That's what you see on the side. And like Facebook, YouTube wants to show you a reasonably customized mix of interesting content. So they want to look at your personal profile and see, oh, what, you know, based on this information, what can we do? But of course, until YouTube knows about your viewing habits, they can't do much about that, right? So if it's your first visit to YouTube or you've cleared your cookies and they don't know who you are anymore, then they're not going to have that. But, you know, if you have an account and you view stuff while logged in, and then you log in again, they'll bring up all of that. So what happens each time you view a video, YouTube tracks that action and adds it to your history, right? So and they have some window. We're not exactly sure how long the history goes. But it goes back a little while. And uh, just like Facebook, uh, there's a time decay factor involved. So if you're watching one video a lot over, say, a month, you'll start seeing it you know, as an option a lot of times on your home page. But then if you stop watching it, it'll gradually go away. It'll get replaced by whatever else you're doing. Because just that you know, if you watch the video 100 times, but the last time you watched it was six months ago, YouTube says, well, you're probably done with this video. You're not going to click on it. We're going to show you something else. So. All that stuff, all those individual history elements, all the user actions, whatever, that's your composite user profile, all the stuff that YouTube knows about you. And they're going to uh, basically use that profile to deliver content that you hopefully find interesting, which is a type of machine learning, right? It's a type of machine learning where they say, people who like this tend to click on this kind of stuff, so that's what we're gonna show you. Okay, when we come back on Monday, We'll discuss learning systems, but this is a good break point, I think. Questions on any of this? All right, and that's all I got for you. Have a good weekend.